Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Izzy Eames, and I am the Serials North Seas Knowledge Exchange Manager for the North East. Um, welcome to our first of four strategic cereal farm webinars that are due to take place this month. Um, and for today's webinar, we're exploring themes around how our strategic farm hosts are improving their efficiency and yield through implementing data and technology um, on the farm. Uh, next slide, please, Maya. There we go. So, uh, just a bit of basic housekeeping before we start, as usual. So, everyone's on mute except the speakers. Um, if you have any questions or you have any, te any technical problems, then there is a questions box to the right. So, please um, put any questions in that question box and we'll answer them at the end in a panel session. Um, and if you didn't enter your basis and row so points at the registration point, then you can also enter your membership number, your postcode, your name, um, and your date of birth into the questions box. Again, that is completely private. Only um, the panel hosts, myself, can see that. Um, and then we can enter you for your basis and Rosso points. Um, we are due to be here until two o'clock after the final comments and final questions have been made. And if you do have to leave halfway through, um, the, the, this is gonna be recorded and it will be available on the AHDB YouTube channel once we've um, finished. Next slide, please, Maya. A bit of a lag on. There we go. So, um, after today's webinar, there are further three webinars taking place um, every Wednesday till the end of the month at the same time, 12 30 till 2 pm. Um, the last webinar, we have got something a little bit different. So we've got Joel Williams, who is an independent soil and plant um, health expert who is coming to join from Canada for a series of events taking place um, across the country as part of our Soil Secrets Tour. So that's going to be taking place at David Aglands up in Scotland with a, a farm walk. Um, but first of all, we're going to have a webinar. So it's quite exciting. Um, and then so the, all of these um try all of these webinars and we've got that sort of start of how to and that's basically so we want to have um, lots of actionable results coming out of this where you can go home to your own farms and implement what we're what we've been talking about um next slide please Maya. so this is just a bit of a timeline um of our current strategic cereal farms so you'll notice that Brian Barker, he's finished, so their six year programme and Brian Barker finished this year with David Jones um, joining us um, in the East as the new strategic farm host. And our strategic cereal farms are where we put cutting edge, re cutting edge research into practice on commercial farms. And we work with independent research bodies like ADAS, NIAB, SRUC, um, and we conduct sort of long or short term trials to answer specific research research questions and then the trial results from these are often presented either in these webinars or we have um op some open farm days um in the summer where we can get all of the attendees to come and visit us at the strategic farms um next slide please Maya. so we're, we're actually quite lucky today we're going to hear from all four trial results from all four of our strategic farm um trials and um, also from some from the past like i said brian barker david's going to be doing over some of his work um previous trial work um and then we've also got a few poll questions throughout just so it gives us a bit of an idea of how you're using data and technology on your farm at home so without further ado next slide please maya just to introduce the first poll question so the first one is are you currently using any technology to help make in-season nitrogen management decisions so if you could just start the first poll, please.
Okay, Brill. Thank you, Maya. Um, next slide, please. Here's the, some of the results. So at the moment, I should just hide this. At the moment, we've got. Oh, I've just gone off the webinar. <laughs> we've got sixty percent of people saying they are currently using um, N sensors, N DVI, to um, manage nitrogen, and thirty percent saying roughly no. Um, so next slide, please, Maya. Uh, can you go on to Steve's presentation? I think it's just one more slide. Here we go. Yeah. So up first, we have Steve from SRUC, um, and we're going to be looking a bit more about that previous poll um, in Steve's presentation. So at Strategic Farm Scotland, they were looking at how to measure and manage crop nutrition throughout the season. Um, and thankfully, Steve's going to be here for the whole presentation, also for the panel session at the end. Um, so if there are any questions for him, please fire away in the question box um, and we'll get to them at the end of the panel session. So without further ado, I'll uh, pass you away to Steve. And if you just want, if you just want to keep saying next slide, Steve, um, and Maya will, will move you on. Thank you very much, uh, Isabel, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as uh, Isabella says, I, I will should just to take uh, an update from the, the Scottish Strategic Farm in collaboration with uh, David Aglan for Burnley Home Farms. And just to bring together this introductory slide, this is our um, objective, is to make more uh, efficient use of the nutrients that we apply towards retaining a a healthy crop and uh, efficient use of all inputs, so extending to, um, to crop uh, protection. So with the duration of the project, we're hoping to quantify both economic and uh, environmental uh, value in the strategy that's, uh, that's taking place. And we've got a big interest in the, the way that we utilize uh, nutrients um, more uh, efficiently towards the healthy crop and uh, soil. So next slide, please. So the first two, two slides here are just indicating generally the, the treatments that we're using in what we call the nitrogen trial and the, the nutrition trial. So nitrogen trial, and here uh, over a couple of years, is looking at different methods of applying nitrogen from what we regard as a standard ammonium nitrate to using uh, liquid and folio forms. And certainly in the, the second year, um, Harvest 23, there was opportunity to uh, downward adjust the um, one of the treatments, so the liquid folio uh, treatment. So all of this is based on um, wide, third, 36 meter wide uh, down lines. So next slide, please. This is the nutrition trial. Now this is a bit more kind of in depth in terms of being able to manipulate both the crop protection and the nutrition aspects of the of the crop. So the crop is it, it's wheat throughout. And again, it's a similar approach, taking a, a tramline plant approach that, that's replicated. And so here we're using what we might regard as standards uh, with and without fungicides, but then tailoring agronomy based on some of the measurements that we make. And this includes some, some novel treatments, um, refer, referred to here as our, as our biology uh, treatment. And we've got scope here for um, adding uh, different micronutrients in this more managed or, or tailored um, approach. Okay, so next slide, please. So this is just reflecting back on the on the harvest at 22 for the, for the next few slides. So this is the nitrogen trial. It's with the the, the tram line, the trial design there with the with the three um, with the two replicates of the three treatments. 
and just a, an indication of the, the field that, that we worked in on the farm in that year. And as well as looking at effects of treatment so across or between the tram lines, we're also interested to look at variation as the field as a whole. And in this, in this particular year, there was quite a, a significant um, north-south gradient in terms of the of soil um, uh, moisture uh, retention that had a, an impact on the on the yield, where the green and the grey being the, the higher yielding parts of the field. So we're trying to take in both the, the treatment effect but also the understanding of the field variation and where some of our measurements might um, ha have a positive impact. So next slide, please. The nutrition trial was in um, a more homogeneous pair of, of adjacent fields. So again, it just shows the layout across the tram lines and again the yield map from, from those fields. And, and then this year we were we were trying to develop um, a bit more confidence in the way that we could use measures such as BRICS, combined SPAD readings with measures or estimates of leaf canopy size and as well as integrate things like uh, SAP um, nutrient measurements as well. Again, to adjust um, the uh, tailored agronomy treatments, but also think about the impacts across the field uh, more generally in terms of the inherent spatial variation. Just next slide, please. So this is the standard measurement, something that's more of a, a traditional field walking approach. But the, the reason for thinking of um, doing the, um, the, the, the plant number and, and the ground cover is that these are things that can ultimately be done through a, a more remotely sensed activity. So it's linking traditionally with, with um, technologies where we can actually do some of this um, uh, remotely. So linking plant um, and, uh, and shoot number, um, crop cover, uh, green leaf area, uh, coinciding with some of the other tests that we make using uh, bricks and, uh, and, and so on. Okay, next slide, please. And again, we, we try to capture as much information we can um, during field walking. And certainly in, in the second year, we, we try to link this into more uh, remote sensing uh, type uh, activity. So this is just an illustration of how we're, we're looking at uh, differences. And this is the, 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 um, the boundary between two particular uh, treatments here. And so we're following change over time and trying to assess the difference we're making um, with our um, uh, tailored approaches, in this case, um, uh, the, the adjustment with nitrogen or any uh, deficiency we see in things like uh, trace elements. Next slide, please. And again, just a, an appreciation of, of, of scale here, just, just looking um, uh, down uh, one of the tram lines and, and just getting a, an idea of of change and how much difference we're making, especially as we're trying to couple measurements together to give some value in terms of um, an indication of the, the health of the crop, but also things such as uh, the, uh, the nitrogen capture by the crop and also link in um, measurements of the crop through to uh, yield, yield forecasting as well. So next slide, please. So BRICS is something we're spending quite a bit of time on. So I suppose compared to some of the, um, the cheap and cheerful li li little ha handheld gadgets that you get, we're using a more kind of sophisticated device. But we're, we're testing this both in the field and in samples we bring back into the lab. So we're really trying to give this a thorough test at different timings during the growing season and, and, across, and across our treatments just to see what's really underlying the difference we do get in, in, in bricks. Now, compared to other uses of bricks, we're at the lower end of the, of, of the scale. So essentially we're measuring um, solute or sugar concentration within the, within the leaf tissue that, that we assess. But compared to BRICS's other uses, perhaps in uh, fruit crops, vegetable crops, where we're looking at product value, we're at the lower end of the scale. And so we're, we're making every effort to try to tease out, to, to differentiate um, between these relatively low numbers that we get 
and on the scale it tends to be between around about 7 uh, to 16 units. So, next slide please. So just um, completing this, um, the idea of bringing measurements together, um, so we're, we're taking measurements uh, using a chlorophyll meter, uh, the visual assessments as we as we do uh, field walking and capture images uh, across different uh, growing uh, stages. And in these um, figures here, just so show individual tram lines, and the upper figure uh, is is actually showing that some evidence of a gradient uh, it's, um, across across the tram lines here in both in in bricks units. Uh, which is in the orange colour and, 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 and SPAD. So that's that inherent gradient we then have to try to take into account as well when we're managing uh, any um, um, trace elements that we might uh, add or uh, and certainly in the second year when we were manipulating uh, the, the nitrogen uh, input as well. The lower figure there is kind of extending the analysis that we do where we're trying to use the um, the, the, the raw data that we've got, the raw measurements, to, to give out an estimate of what we call the, the crop uh, nitrogen pool, which is something under development, but we think could be quite a, uh, a powerful way to link ground measurements to more remotely sensed measurements. So next slide, please. What we want to do throughout this is to make sure when we're when we're trying to advise David and colleagues on the any adjustment to management, we want to make sure that we are linking um, growth development of crop through to um, crop output. So here is just a, an illustration um, in both the, well, the nitrogen trial on the left hand side, so that was six tram lines, and the nutrition trial right hand side on um, eight tram lines. So this link um, in the the area that we measured intensively um, in, and that's leaf area. In that in that zone to grain yield, so we want to make sure that we're we're informing management but still being able to link changes in the crops growth and development ultimately through to yield and and quality of the crop. So this is kind of integral to the project is to bring all of these different um, elements together, both informing management and um, and an insight to uh, to the to the yield potential of the of of, of the crop. So next slide, please. So that was leaf area. And another way uh, that we're, we're trying to couple uh, different measurements is bringing together this with, with, with SPAD. Now, there's lots of tools and technologies out there that are bringing these, um, these types of measurements together in different ways. And uh, what we're trying to do ultimately is to add another layer uh, that relates to the, to the health of the crop. And potentially overlay other measures such as SAP and BRICS into the same uh, analysis to be much more informative about the change in crop health during the season. Okay, next slide, please. So that was a, um, just a, a reflection there on the um, on harvest 22, and now up to date from the last harvest. So here we actually worked on um, three adjacent fields here. Um, so the, the nitrogen trial, the one in the middle of the of the slide there, again with, with the six tram lines um, across the field there. The yellow area, uh, one to six, indicates the measurement zone, so the main measurement zone um, in that field. And interestingly, this particular field had um, had a, um, a, a relic uh, castle, ruined castle, and a couple of trees in the field, which, which, which again um, are, are, are obviously part of the general kind of field topography, but it actually creates quite a lot more uh, gradient either side of those uh, do dominant features. The nutrition trial, that was in two adjacent fields, front of Bandon and the Den, and the, um, the yellowish colored uh, band uh, across those fields relate to the main measurement zone. And the, the greenish band in the den also is another uh, check uh, for, for measurements. And one thing to note here, um, the farm also introduced grazing into the uh, front of uh, abandon. 
so we have a, a, a grazing effect that we, we're taking into account, which is actually producing some very interesting um, early information that perhaps we, we, we could follow up um, uh, in, in, in the coming season. So next slide, please. Just briefly, the, um, the way we managed the, the treatments at the nitrogen trial here, we, we had a, a standard of around 160 kilos of total N, and this year there was an option to reduce one of the, the liquid um, failure treatments there. So we had an opportunity to trim that. Uh, again, this is, this is trying to think a way that the crop is utilising nitrogen. We don't want to compromise quality of the crop. We're thinking all along the way, can we improve the, the, the efficiency of the crop in relation to its, its health status that, that we monitor? So next slide, please. So this is um, just a table of some of the uh, results, in this case at SPAD, over different dates. So in, if you look at the, the upper part of the graph in, in, the, in that kind of peach color, um, we've got the growth stage there um, through stem extension. And you can see that the SPAD reading overall was rather conservative across this particular trial. Now that's actually, I thought that was quite a positive thing in that we, we were generally maintaining health status of the plants, um, nutrient capture, nitrogen capture of, 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 of the crop. Uh, across our across our different treatments. So then the ultimate um, added value is how efficient the, uh, the, the crop is, is utilising that nitrogen um, could come harvest results. And I'll present those results um, at the webinar on the 28th of, um, of November. The green part of the of the, of the chart here uh, essentially shows again uh, how relatively conserved the uh, the SPAD readings were uh, across the different um, ammonium nitrate treatments and uh, and and then plus uh, plus uh, liquid and, uh, and and folia. So there was evidence of field gradient, but when it comes to the treatment needs, um, overall we can have a well conserved um, um, value there, and you can see the, there was no significant treatment effect overall in in the uh, the bottom part of the table. So next slide, uh, please. And so this, this is looking at uh, leaf area and, 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 and bricks. So in terms of leaf area index, although there was no um, significant difference between the treatments, um, certainly two of the tram lines were uh, slower behind in, in, in growth and had smaller uh, leaf areas. And that was an inherent field gradient that we, we had to take into account. So you can see that there is impacted on the, on the uh, ammonium, nitrogen, uh, ammonium nitrate and, um, and, and, and urea and the ammonium nitrate and the, and, and, and the folia N uh, treatments there. In terms of bricks, um, there was um, a change uh, according to uh, growth stage and, and date, but no um, significant uh, treatment effect. And you can see the general trend there of a downward uh, um, 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 change in, in, in BRICS units um, dur during um, Next slide, please. One of the key things we're, we're doing now, based on the first two years of the work and, and then into this third year, is, is to try to value this continuous monitoring that we make. So here we've got um, an estimate of green leaf area, we've got our stat value, we've got a, an estimate of the crop nitrogen pool and the BRICS value. Now these are individual tram lines rather than treatments, but it's just highlighting as we go through to the um, to the later stages here, uh, uh, into late um, extension, um, the, the difference we were picking up in a couple of the tram lines. So we're trying to, as well as think about the treatments um, that we're adjusting, we're actually trying to think about um, obviously different parts of the field uh, the crop is, is inherently different because of, of, of gradients uh, within the field. And you can see that that's had a big impact if we couple um, um, uh, uh, leaf area or green leaf area with um, crop greenness or SPAD, and then we estimate the crop uh, N pool. And so going forward, um, adjustments can, can be made accordingly to address um, 
a, a crop with less growth or, or is backward in its development. So next slide, please. So this is really perhaps getting to where this might all go in future. So this is just a, an image um, taken um, um, at, at the end of the uh, extension, um, so late, late May. Uh, so a drone uh, image, and you can see um, evidence of variation uh, across the field with a couple of tram lines, particularly five. Um, it's, it, it, it's thinner as, as, a, as a lower uh, spout reading, but you can see gradients also uh, left and right uh, in, in the tram lines as, as well as uh, uh, across the tram lines. So ultimately, we'd like to couple the, the ground with the remote sensing activity, which I think can be um, much more useful in developing a, a real-time uh, adjustment, particularly to, to major nutrients uh, such as uh, nitrogen, but then couple that with uh, on-ground measurements where we might need to address um, the de de deficiencies. Okay, next slide, please. Just on nutrition, again, just indicating this particular slide, the, the way we could think about the treatments between the standard and the tailored approaches, and again, trimming slightly the, the nitrogen in the tailored approach, but also having the opportunity to address any uh, trace element uh, issues uh, in these in these particular treatments. And again, the the management of um, fungicide can um, vary around the standard, uh, particular attention where we need to protect against um, perhaps the devastating impact that, that yellow rust uh, might, might have, for example. But the idea being that um, the tailored agronomy is creating perhaps a healthier crop that is a bit more resilient uh, to any disease pressures, particularly uh, sectoria uh, that might occur during the season. So next slide, please. So just finishing, gave me some uh, indication of the leaf area and the SPAD uh, readings uh, across uh, the, the treatment means, so across, across the two fields. And I think the main thing to pick up here is that um, certainly in the tailored treatment, we have uh, initially through tailoring stem extension, we have a, a lower leaf area and a lower SPAD uh, uh, reading as well. But because of the the different strategy for crop protection, actually the tailored agronomy, um, I think with a better balance of um, protection and, and nutrient management, actually uh, responds well later in the season. So I think the, the yellow rust pressure was perhaps uh, higher in the standard compared to the tailor, tailored agronomy, hence this, um, this switch over. Uh, and you can see that particularly in the SPAD reading, where we get a, a perhaps a evidence um, at growth stage uh, or start of stem extension up to growth um, stem extension um, 31, 32, uh, 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 perhaps a, 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 a more a yellow looking crop uh, that then uh, picks up uh, much more strongly than the that, that, than the standard agronomy, which which continued, I think, to be affected by by the early disease, unlike the um, the, the, the the tailored agronomy crop. Okay, so I think just finishing off now. Um, I think with the next slide, please. Again, just trying to think about the, the the grazing effect here. Initially, the grazing, and this is leaf area and spad, hits um, the crop um, in the front of Bandon quite quite severely in terms of um, its um, leaf area developments and also the spad reading had, had much lower levels there. So I was quite quite amazed at how, how even um, how homogenous grazing could be when it's managed well. And so the farm did a, a, a job here that enabled the crop to be grazed incredibly evenly across the whole field. So every plant looked exactly the same after the grazing, but it, as I say, it had a hit in terms, obviously in terms of its leaf area and, and, it, and its leaf color. But there's evidence that it, that it actually picked up and towards stem extension and later, uh, there was no significant difference between the grazed and the ungrazed crops in terms of their uh, leaf area and um, Oh, indeed, the, the spout reading um, suggests that it, it was actually very effective at taking up nitrogen later on. So next slide, please. 
So again, just extending to, um, to the more remote sensing type activity. So here you can actually see um, the uh, three, four, six and eight uh, at this stage, late May, are the tailored agronomy. And I would say that these, these particular uh, tram lines uh, treatments were looking um, better in terms of their nutrient capture, but also their, um, their, their lower levels of leaf uh, loss because of disease. Okay, and that, that kind of evolved uh, dur during the stem extension phase. Okay, so I'll, I'll go into more detail of this uh, in terms of yield um, at, at the later uh, webinar. Okay, so I think that leads just, just to the summary, the, the final slide and the, and, and the summary. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, so um, we're continuing to think about um, the, the design of these trials uh, in relation to the, to, to the farm business. And here the focus is very much on the nutrition, the health of the plants and, uh, and the soil. And we're thinking of methods of application, timing of application as informed by a suite of, of, of different measurements. And we want to try to think of what um, is most informative and is, and is a coupling of all the measurements that's ultimately going to give us the best uh, guidance. So we're looking at continuous monitoring, linking some of the ground measurements, uh, the end state, towards end status, and status of, of other um, elements through, through SAP analysis. And I think ultimately, I think we can link this um, to, to more remote site ten, uh, sensing. Bricks and SAP testing. I think the jury's still out, certainly as far as our project is concerned. Um, as I mentioned at the start, We've got a rather sort of conserved range on, on the BRICS scale. And so at the moment, I'm, I'm not making kind of um, hard, kind of fast rules of the value of BRICS in terms of which way we go with, the, with adjusting nutrients. I think we, we need a, uh, a more complete analysis of, of, of data, perhaps across other farms as well, before we have, um, I think, more um, um, uh, confidence on, on, on the value of, of, of bricks at different times of the, um, the season. And just the final point there, really, just uh, we are trying to, across the farm to link the, the plant and the soil health together um, towards producing a, a quality crop, but uh, in a much more uh, resource efficient uh, way. So I think that's the final slide, uh, Isabel. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Can you just pass me the next slide, please, Maya? Yeah, brilliant. So thank you so much, Steve, for a really thorough overview of some of the nitrogen nutrition trials taking place um, at Street Farm Scotland. Um, I think it's quite interesting what you're saying about trying to um, not reduce the quality at all, but just improve the way that that crop is using the nitrogen. And that through that, you're sort of measuring and managing throughout the season. Um, I think that's probably something that we're going to be replicating at Strategic Farm North um, for this year, for the Harvest 24. So it'd be great to have some of that replication from the North and also into Scotland. Um, it'd be really interesting to compare results after that year. Um, and I think you said quite a lot of the results from the yields are going to be in the final webinar um, on the 28th as well. So yeah, definitely sign up to that to see what the results of the trials have been. Do you think that the grazing is going to continue into 2024? Is that going to be something that's going to be common practice now, or are you still just testing and trialling it? Well, it was it was a very interesting discussion, as you might imagine, uh, at, at the planning uh, about a year ago, and when we were discussing grazing, because that adds another whole new layer to to, to the to the experiment. And um, so um, there are ways that it can be done by. Um, splitting fields and grazing half of fields or even graze uh, whole, whole fields or that, that can compromise on replication because we, yeah. we have a we have a grazed rep and an ungrazed rep but but it was a fact that uh fairly regular monitoring we were able to follow that that grazing effect through and it was quite clear oh, obviously we we're going to get a reduction in in leaf area to start with but it's how that crop then responds and we can follow that through and, and I can present things such as a shoot and, and the ear number uh, at, at, at the later uh, meeting. How we can actually follow things through that the right type of grazing can possibly have a, po a, a, can have a positive impact 
on the crop. So it's getting that right and then put it into context of, of the farm business for both the sustaining the, the plant health and, and obviously the value for the, for the livestock as well. So yes. that's sheep grazing that was moved around different fields on the farm uh, in, the, in this almost like a rotational sort of way. Yeah. Oh. I suppose sheep aren't exactly very uh, predictable, are they? So you can't tell them what's <laughs> I was I was just incredibly impressed with the way that they could um not being a sheep livestock person, how how sheep can um graze incredibly uniformly. Every plant was actually identical. Wow. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Steve. Um so before we move on to Susie, just the next slide, please, Maya. So we're gonna we're gonna have a look at the strategic soil farm north at some of the trial results there. So things where we've got over a decade worth of data and information. What do you do with it all? Um, and the answer is you get Susie to come in and help us clear, clear it all up. So uh, before we go on to Susie's presentation, we have got another poll. So if you move on to the poll, Maya, um, this is where we're going to be looking at what is the main thing that prevents you from. Um, using historic farm data to make decisions. So, do you just put the poll up, please, Maya? Oh. Brilliant. Thank you, Maya. I think we can close the close the poll. Uh, so that's a good result. Everyone is using <laughs> um, making use of historic farm data. And I think that's probably something that will be it, David will talk us through some of the yield map work that he's been doing at Strategic Farm East later on. Uh, some really interesting results from that on how you can sort of better utilize yield maps on the farm. Um, but firstly, um, Susie, if you'd like to take control of your slides um, and we're going to get started with Susie's section. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a, an intro from David or am I diving in? Yeah, I think Dave's, <laughs> I think Dave's coming in. If he's still there. So we've got our street farm host, David Blacker. Here he is, the legend. He's going to give a bit of an introduction to what we're doing here. Yeah, so the um, over over the years, I've been yield mapping on the combines now for about 20 years. Uh, so I've got loads of yield data. Um, started with a basic uh, PK mag lime soil test, uh, and as time's gone on, I've just collected more and more uh, data. We've added organic matter into the test and put calcium in there. Um, tested a few of the nutrients that we could get the the CEC, um, and then and in the end, I thought well, I was spending so much money. I may as well just go all in and, and do a full spectrum on nutrients. Um, uh, I've got soil, uh, soil uh, texture data, so present sand, present silt, present clay, uh, conductivity scans. Um, I've had uh, carbon bursts done uh, to give an indication of the, uh, the microbial activity. Um, but I got to a point really where I've got just so much data, I just don't know what to do with it. Um, and also I'm picking up a yield map and then uh, trying to see why some bits are good and some bits are bad. Uh, and there's just too much information to compute. So I'd pick some of the favorites out. I'd always pick organic matter and look at a yield map against organic matter. And I could never, never get to a point where I could actually uh, say yes or no that high organic matters were actually influencing yield. So, um, so the whole point of this was just taking a different unbiased view at it and putting this through a, 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 a big computer system uh, that Susie's had the, uh, the pleasure of um, uh, tackling um, to see if we could get any unbiased uh, re reasons why some bit, bits are good and some bits are bad. Great, thank you, David. Um, so, as David says, the the problem that we're seeking to address is um, yield variation, and we know that, like every field, um, there is 
considerable variation in David's fields because back in 2012 we had a, a different AHDB project which included um, chessboard trials with a grid of different nitrogen rates and in that particular field um, yield at the optimum nitrogen rate ranged from seven and a half to 11 tonnes per hectare and that's completely typical um, and the, the conclusion of that project the auto end project was that nitrogen is not the biggest factor behind yield variation it's actually more soil factors and maybe water availability and we found in analysis of the ADAS yen database that soil texture is very important um, we get higher yields from water retentive soils like clays and loams than we do from sandy soils um, the opportunity is David's wealth of precision farming data yield maps and soil maps and so our goal is to to understand what's behind all this yield variation so um, David gave us yield maps for the last 11 years for five fields um, doing the whole farm would have been too much for us we had um, electrical conductivity maps and soil maps for a variety of nutrients and textures and um, you might have these on your own farms across lots of different softwares and farm management platforms you get them on omnia and visor and field view and um, these ones are from soyl from my own family's farm um, it's worth noting that soil maps are usually much lower density so um, the one on the bottom left is quite a high density map for one of the five fields we looked at there were only eight data points on it so that's a, a limitation there and we also looked at weather data so we we sourced it on a, a daily level and this shows weekly rainfall compared to the long-term average but if you don't have that then um, Met Office anomaly maps are really useful. So that shows the same period, and these both show um, autumn 2019, which I'm sure you'll remember in your nightmares. It's very wet. Um, so what we what we did with all that data, we cleaned up the yield maps because they're always very noisy, and we took off the headlands and anomalous data points. And then to deal with the fact that we were looking at a host of different types of crop we converted yields in tons per hectare to yield as a percentage of the average for that crop in that region using DEFRA data and that put them all on the same scale and then all the different sorts of maps with their different densities and different scales um, we creaked and that means we uh, interpolated the data points to get a, a continuous um data layer which we then averaged over a 24 meter grid because david's on 24 meter tram lines and that put all the data onto the same scale um, and we did some stats with that um, a couple of different methods to look for correlations in the data to see which soil factors correlated with yield and the weather data, we just had that in the background to help us explain the patterns we found. So first off, comparing between different crops, um, I better just mention the scale here is, as I said, um, yield as a percentage of the regional average. Um, our method was a little flattering to David perhaps, because by cleaning the headlands off the yield maps, we artificially inflate the yield a little bit. So um, the fact that all the averages are over 100%, that's partly why. Um, but winter wheat was the most reliable and high yielding crop um, across the ones we looked at. Um, oilseed rape was the most variable, as I guess it is for many people. And so these, these are the five fields across the top here in all the years with yield as a percentage of, of the regional average. And you can see that by field, um, Newton 1 was the, the highest yielding. And that's notable as the field 
of these five with the lightest soil, whereas um, Overton five has the heaviest soil um, and a history of problems with waterlogging, which is why um, you'll hear in a different webinar that there's a, a drainage trial going on there as part of the strategic farm. When we looked within fields, I'm just going to look at, at one of them as an example. So this is this field is called New Farm 4. And in this and all the fields, we found um, patterns, the same patterns cropping up in most years. But then just the odd year that was different. So you can see in 2013, the um, east corner of the field was very low yielding. But in most years, that was the best corner of the field. And that's when we go and look at the weather data and say, what was what was different about 2013? Well, that was a year where waterlogging wasn't a big problem. Um, the rainfall was fairly modest over the winter, and then they had problems with drought in the summer. And when we look at the soil maps, we find that that corner of the field has the lightest soil, which in wet years is an advantage, but in that dry summer is a disadvantage. And so that corner droughted out. So the, the conclusion from looking um, between fields, within fields, was that waterlogging is, we think, the, the biggest yield limitation on, on the fields we looked at. Um, if you look at all the five fields here, they're all higher yielding at the, the top of the hill. Um, so Newton 1 here is um, downhill towards the, the south end. And these other four fields all slope downhill towards the railway that runs between them. And they're all lower yielding at the downhill ends. They all have um, lower yields compared to the, the region in seasons where um, with very high winter, autumn and winter rainfall, um, at least of the winter crops. And as I said before, the, the fields with lighter soil had better average yields. And this all adds up to waterlogging being um, a big problem, which I think is not news to David. Um, he particularly asked us to have a look at organic matter. And so um, we had a look at not just straight organic matter, but the ratio of organic matter to clay content, because that's often um, suggested as a, a good measure of soil health. And it did explain more variation in yield than any of the other soil factors we looked at. But the pattern is the opposite direction to what you might expect. So you can see on these graphs here, and the different coloured dots are for different seasons. And each dot is one 24 metre grid square. And you can see that as the organic matter content rises, um, yield falls in most seasons. Now, we, you know, this is, you might have heard the phrase, correlation is not causation. And our best guess is that um, waterlogging is the cause of both higher organic matter and lower yield. So at the, the downhill end of the fields, we find that organic matter is higher, probably because um, as it sits there in the wet soil, it, it can't cycle and, and break down and be used. So waterlogging is, is reducing yield and separately it's leading to higher organic matter. And so um, these results don't mean that organic matter isn't a good thing, just that it's not the defining factor in the yield variation here. And perhaps on sandier soils, um, we'd see much uh, more the patterns we, we'd expect where organic matter would help with water retention as well as nutrient availability and soil health. And so when it comes to, to soil health and organic matter, I think the lesson is that it's good to get the, the basics right of soil structure and, and drainage. And, and then the organic matter could perhaps be more useful to us. So, let's see. The, the level of 
analysis that we did on the yield maps and you know, Krieging and stats is not something we'd expect every farmer to do. But just by eyeballing the yield maps from multiple years next to each other, and particularly for fields that you feel are underperforming, and looking for which parts of the field are consistently high or low yielding, and which seasons break the pattern, and then looking at the, the weather data is a good idea, because then you can, by looking at what's different about an odd year, you can better understand what is behind the usual variation. And where there is a, a consistent pattern of a, a certain corner of the field being high or low, that's when I'd go to the soil maps and say, well, what does this match? Is it the, the soil texture or the slope? Is it nutrient content or the organic matter? And so I think a lot of the lessons we found um, could be found just by, by eyeballing the maps in that way. So, thank you. That's, that's me done. Brilliant. Thank you. Just while we get back onto the presentation, um, so I don't think it comes as a surprise to Dave that also grape is the most variable um, crop in his rotation. Uh, I think it's actually something he's taken out of his rotation now. Um, I think it was really interesting that point about organic matter, just to echo what you're saying is, you know, you can have this high organic matter levels in your soil, but it's not actively cycling with through being improving um, like physical structure through drainage, then it's not really doing any any good well it could be doing a lot better um and i suppose it's not looking at organic matter in isolation of what else is going on in the soil um i think that was a really interesting point and also the fact that you know you can you can look at yield maps at home and it's probably most of it is probably what you already know but it's using those yield maps to confirm it identify trends um and then make management decisions from that dave is there anything you'd like to add to that Oh, you're on mute, I think. I'd have quit every time I've heard that. <laughs> you wouldn't be farming, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think you're, you're right with the organic matter. You know, we've all kind of been uh, led down this journey of thinking that organic matter, high organic matter is the, you know, the be-all and end-all of everything that we do, and we're all striving to increase that. Um, so it's it's quite interesting to actually see that actually high organic matter can be an indication of poor poor soil health, not good soil health. Uh, so it's it's you know taking taking all the factors into account and um, looking at looking at all the detail in context of the field itself, rather than just looking at a, a face value figure on a on a piece of paper. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and I think. We're going to be also going into the drainage trial on the 28th of November, and we're going to be looking at some results from that. So that's just quite a nice follow up to, you know, what was Dave's barriers to Dave's yield. Most of it wasn't the organic matter levels, it was the water logging. So um, it's really great that we've also got a trial um, over to five on that as well. So um, thank you very much, Susie, and thanks, Dave, for that. Um, this, this next poll question is going to move us quite nicely on to the next section, which also, Susie, we've been talking about yield maps. Um, oh, that's not. <laughs> if you just start the poll, um, Maya, I think that's the wrong question. But we'll just we'll just um, move on to the poll. There we go. Brilliant. Thank you, Maya. Just close the poll. Yeah. So 90% of people say that they are currently using yield maps to make planning decisions, whether that be rotations or nutrient management or stewardship or, or things like that. So um, this next um, this next presentation from David is going to be looking at sort of the one of the existing trials at Strategic Farm East um, and also the upcoming trials with Strategic Farm East as well. So um, who of our previous hosts, uh, well, current, previous hosts and our current host, um, and hopefully be looking a bit more in depth at yield maps. So brilliant. Thank you, Dave. If you'd like to take control. Just need to share the slides. Yeah. 
sometimes getting blinded by the sun, but I don't want to ever say anything about the sun again after the horrendous weather that we've had. So I'm just going to try to pop out of it. Brilliant. Good. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully you can see that. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, I'll see that. Good. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm David Clark. I uh, work in the Soils and Farming System team at NIA, based at Morley, but we've been working with Brian at Strategic Farm East in Suffolk for the last five years, four years now. Um, obviously, we do some work at Morley, which I'm going to touch on in this presentation, but also what we're going to do at Morley in continuation of Strategic Farm East in the coming years. So, Brian's um, uh, Brian Farms uh, on a sort of sandy clay, sandy loam soil down in Suffolk. Uh, 513 hectares of combinable crops um, with 12 year long rotation uh, with wheat, orchid, rape, spring barley, and then a herbage grass seed, which although combined doesn't give us yield maps, and then some um, spring beans, spring lean seed making up uh, some of that rotation as well. Um, we, as part of what we were trying to do early on is, is to in investigate marginal land um, with SFI was at the time down the pipeline looking at how we could identify which parts of the farm could be best suited environmental schemes. We obviously wanted to look at the whole farm as a whole. Um, so we did that, uh, focusing on the 35 fields that have been farmed more uh, across the last 12 years by Brown. Uh, so that equaled 457 hectares. Now, obviously with the, the, the grass seed in there, we didn't have a complete rotational uh, spatially mapped yields. Um, you can see as well as things like field trials or uh, combining error, uh, we didn't quite get a full uh, rotational picture, but uh, on average, 75% of the whole rotation was spatially mapped. And when you work out of the contributions to the whole farm margin over the last 10 years, we had about 65% of the total margin was, had been spatially mapped uh, through his yield maps. That's from 2009, so, sorry, 2011 to 2020. Susie mentioned it that yield maps are inherently noisy. Um, so we developed some cleaning procedures, pretty standard procedures to uh, clean every single one of these yield maps up. Um, we uh, move, remove things that are uh, obvious, things as outliers, so zero yields or, or 25 tons a hectare. Well, Brian uh, didn't, I'm sure he's a very good farmer, and he is a very good farmer, but we, we didn't believe anything over sort of 15, 16, 17 tons. Um, and then we also remove things where with the combine it recorded change in direction or we were able to identify individual swaths and where the swath spacing didn't match the combine header width, either too large, uh, primarily too small, suggesting that it was a, a tidying up run at the end. Um, it's important that if, if you are using your maps, I, I know a lot of the standard software does have some features and, and it is important that we use them. We identified about 15% of the, all of the yield data collected was probably erroneous. Um, we collected just under a million data points uh, and got rid of uh, quite a fair number of them. You can see by the, how it improved the, both the standard deviation of the yield maps, but also uh, the variation within the yield map. So to understand the spatial differences within yield, we really needed those cleaning steps. So to encourage people to use them where they are available and they are getting better uh, every as, as new software updates, whether it's with class or John Deere or, or whoever you might use, um, I'm hoping that they'll improve these uh, so we can do them on farm instead of having to extract the map data out of that software. Another word of caution, uh, as well as uh, yield data for every field, um, Brian also collected actual field offtake. So this was you uh, measured using grain trailer away cells that were calibrated. So we were able to compare the field mean with the combine field mean with the actual uh, offtake mean and you can see that there's quite a large well there can be quite large differences generally it was pretty good but there was the potential for quite large errors and on average in wheat this was uh, about a 0.79 ton a hectare which at the time when we were doing this at wheat at 240 pound a ton obviously gave us quite a large margin of error in terms of our our actual margin of about 190 pounds a hectare. And when we're comparing this to, um, at the time, estimated prices SFI, obviously this could put a lot of doubt in, 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 in identifying which one was the better option. Anyway, um, this kind of gave us a whole farm uh, yield map. Um, of course, we, we use something called clustering, sorry, which is a machine learning algorithm that identifies patterns within the data sets. And basically we identified about 135 management zones. So within each of those zones, 
we can expect the yield to be consistent. So um, the things that are influencing yield within those zones are the same. And you can see we can look at how it how stable those yields are. So, for example, in the, in the map on the left, sort of the blue zones are really stable. We know they're always going to perform the same, either high or low yielding compared to the field average. The red ones are unstable, so a little difficult, more difficult to manage, as in they fluctuate between high and low yielding. But we can look at the margin uh, and the, the the graph, the image on the right, is the is the margin of each zone compared to the highest margin on farm and actually uh, Brian used this data um, as he was looking for his 2023 uh, contract stewardship schemes and, and identified zones that were more profitable within the schemes um, and that uh, equaled about 40 hectares of the farm. But then after that, that kind of led on to where we are and what we've been doing over the last couple of years is obviously, obviously we can take out that, that least profitable 40 hectares or however it may be, but that also left quite a large area of the farm that was, was le less productive compared to the highest performing parts of each field. And on average, over 150 hectares of the farm um, was actually losing over 100 pound a hectare to compare to the highest uh, performing part in the field. And Brian was interested in how we could and we were interested in how we could potentially manage that spatial variation uh, to improve the margin but also potentially uh, to deliver sort of better environmental outcomes so just one example i'm, I'm going to quickly flick back to morley at, at how yield maps um, can be useful in determining what's going on in the ground um, we've done a similar exercise at morley you can see the farm there um, with the zones uh, and then how they're um, yield, whether they're high yielding or low yielding, uh, or whether they're unstable. Uh, and we've done um, detailed carbon stock measurements across 25, uh, 25 of these zones. And you can see actually the standardized yield performance. So if it's a, a low yielding or a high yielding zone can go some way to explain the total carbon stocks within the farm. Now, this is probably more of a sort of positive feedback loop on this uh, sort of light land where we've got higher clay content, we've got higher yields, therefore we get higher uh, and clay is obviously uh, better at retaining soil carbon, but also we've got higher yields, higher crop residues going back. But just showing how these whole farm yield map data sets can actually help us understand something else, such as soil carbon stocks, which might be important going forward with, with measuring soil carbon, also meeting net zero goals. But back to Brian's farm. Um, last year, what we did was to keep it quite simple. We just men it, man it, uh, measured 12 zones um, and 12 sites within these zones, uh, six in barley, six in wheat, and looked at all different things, both soil and crop, uh, to see if there's anything we could do differently um, to both improve yields or improve margins. Uh, one thing that came out uh, was that on these, particularly these low yielding headland zones, you can see um, the H next to the site uh, on the left there. Basically, our grain nitrogen was at or above what we'd expect optimal for yield. We expect about 1.9% grain N is optimal for feed wheat. Uh, and you can see certainly on that top field, um, actually, we were well above that. Potentially, uh, we'd have been applying too much nitrogen. So again, we, we decided to focus on wheat this year and do something similar. So we picked four fields um, from the long-term data set. And you can see the the management zone number there basically one is the highest yielding zone within each field the dark blue and all the way up to six is the lowest yielding some fields don't have six zones for example long meadows only got three um but you can see uh the long-term consistency down the bottom of the graphs of how actually most of those zones are pretty stable as in those that are low yielding are always low yielding compared to the field average those that are high yielding are always high yielding so we selected 12 sites within these, these zones. Um, each field had a headland zone. Now we were interested in the headlands because obviously they are historically lower yielding, but also although um, uh, you know tend to be lower yielding for, from, from the fact that we, we have the turning headlands and, and the compaction, but also they do make up not an insignificant, insignificant part of the farmed area. So actually important to, to monitor on them as well as just the intrinsically infield lowered yielding areas and the high yielding areas. So, so the number three in each field is, is the headland site and uh, one is the highest yielding and then two sort of the medium or lower yielding site as well within the field. We're focusing on nitrogen um, because Brian and, and the farm there have made a concerted effort to try and re 
really reduce their nitrogen, both from an environmental and economic um, a standpoint. You can see how they've uh, been able to make progress of that over the last 10 uh, or 12 years. You see generally nitrogen's come down um, from a high sort of in, in the early or the mid 2010s to around about 250 down to 200 ton, uh, 200 kilograms of nitrogen a hectare currently and all those fields uh, that we're going to look at this this we looked at this year had about 200 kilos of nitrogen that was 180 as soil applied um, and then 20 kilos from a, um, a fully applied end at the end of the season uh, all going towards did not meet not with the aim of um, they weren't necessarily for a, a, a quality market um, but they were a, a soft wheat with the option to do that, although they were all grown as feed wheats as the season uh, didn't allow uh, those premiums to be chased. But it's also important there to include the margins. Obviously, uh, they don't want to, they want to reduce their nitrogen uh, reliance on uh, mineral nitrogen, but obviously not an expensive margin. You can see, although nitrogen has come down, generally margins are, uh, although no significant trend, are uh, certainly not uh, decreasing. So it's, it's an idea of keeping progress of reducing M, but not at the cost of, 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 of yield and economics. So obviously it's one one advantage of using yield maps. Um, I've lost my slides, I don't know if you, hopefully you can still see it. Um, one advantage of using the yield maps is um, that it can reduce our needs for targeted soil samples. We can we don't have to do um, a gridded sample. We could potentially look at a zone and say if we take sample a targeted point within that zone it's representative of the zone on a whole and the two graphs here show how the sampling site which is is identified by the red dot um how that yield within that site so within 30 meters of that single site correlates to the zone as a whole and you can see actually the site yield explained about 82 percent of the variation of the cluster within each year and then across years over 90% of the variation was explained within a cluster by that single site. So if you're, if you're pretty confident that your clusters are stable and, and that those points within that cluster, within that zone, are, are consistently yielding, then you know, we don't necessarily need to sample hundreds and hundreds of points within those zones. Um, we could pick a representative area, and that's what we've done uh, within this project. So we've just done some sort of routine assessments that you might do on farm, uh, obviously soil nutrients, pH, organic matter and texture, um, some vets and earthworms, tissue nutrient testing. Um, we did some head counts, uh, SPAD, which is a measure of chlorophyll, as Steve mentioned earlier. Um, we did some disease, although there wasn't uh, much disease measured, so I haven't included that today. Um, and then obviously we focused on things like grain nutrients at harvest uh, and yield and then obviously some soil nitrogen post harvest to look at uh, potentially uh, inefficient use of not applied N. So obviously we want to uh, tend to end with yield. It makes sense to, to finish with yield, start with yield here just to show that what we've seen this year or over the last year was consistent with what we'd seen previously. Um, so you can see the yield maps for the clean the clean deal maps for last year for those four fields. You can, first thing to point out is on Long Meadow, the long field on the right of the map, there was a bit of black grass on um, our first sampling sites. We did actually move that slightly north into the zone, uh, certainly for the crop measurements that wasn't impacted by black grass. Um, but in generally our, our yield in 2023 went with how it had historically gone within those zones. So our yield performance was was representative of what the yield limiting factors were in those zones over the last 10 years. Uh, and you can see there that basically the relative yield within each cluster um, across the last 10 year data set was similar to the relative yield we saw in 2023, um, which is good, that's what we wanted to see. So obviously using um, AHTB soil health scorecards, a good way, the first place to to start and to see is there anything obvious going on within the soil that we could be adjusting that might explain this yield variation. Uh, I've included the standardized yield variation in wheat for each of those zones. So for example, K1 tends to be 0.4 tons a hectare higher than the farm field average, whereas K3 is uh, over a ton lower than the field average for that zone. And you can see generally a, a, a 
you know, the soil health scores good way of, of checking if anything obvious is, is going wrong or, or potentially could be leading to inefficiencies. Uh, and generally for P and K, Brian's doing a very good job of managing those indices that aren't going to be expected to limit yield. Uh, Brian acknowledges that mag magnesium is more difficult to, to manage on this lighter land. Um, and you can see actually quite a few of the sites were below index two magnesium. Uh, pH generally where we want it to be. And then the other thing of notice, obviously, the headland sites, which tend to get a bit more traffic, um, we did see an increase in best score there, potentially uh, up to a level that might be reducing uh, crop performance and rooting. You can see in the images S1 in the shrubbery field, a high yielding site, best score, and then the headland site there, uh, larger, uh, more angular aggregates, certainly at the bottom of that uh, 25 centimetres. Very briefly, we obviously we um, wanted to look at texture. We do have um, soil electrical conductivity maps, which on these soil types is a is a, is a good. Which on these deep soils where um, sort of soil depth isn't a limiting factor, EC is very good at measuring um, sort of clay content. And you can see um, we do have some variation in C EC across the sites, and also that's picked up in texture. Shrubbery, not masses of difference in the top 60 centimeters. Um, whereas Kells, we do see that uh, K2 site, which is on the higher EC down the bottom of the field, uh, with slightly higher uh, clay content, certainly at depth. Uh, Rush Bottom, again, at that higher the headland site on the top of the field with the higher EC, slightly heavier soil, um, both in the topsoil and at depth. <coughs> Excuse me. And then Long Meadow, we have the um, L2, which is the medium yielding site down the bottom there with slightly heavier. I, I take that this is all done by laser diffraction. I, I'm not sure we only sent one sample off. Um, I'm a bit skeptical of that um, green dot of depth. Um, when we took the samples, uh, both from our soil core and when we um, done vest scores, I don't didn't didn't see that um, physically in, in terms of the, how the soil felt. So I think that might be an error in the measurement. So obviously it's worth doing potentially uh, resampling some of these if you if you question what you might get back. Uh, so looking at um, our crop results and again focusing on nitrogen, this is the, the, the main focus of the work. Um, we didn't see much correlation between what we were measuring and yield or grain N. So for example, our um, gray stage 30 leaf uh, nitrogen concentrations or gray stage 69 leaf N concentrations were correlated well together. They also correlated very well to our SPAD uh, meter um, readings, but they didn't go any way to explaining our variation in yield or grain N across the sites or within fields. Um, what was notable is that grain N nitrogen was only optimal at levels for feed wheat on two sites, so similar to last year. Um, actually, we, we, with 200 kilos of N, didn't quite make our 1.9 grain N. Now, there's a lot of uh, variation within that as a benchmark, and it, it's good to test these on your own farm. And that's uh, one of the advantages of doing such similar exercises here is seeing how spatially metrics like that stack up on your own farm. Um, but, but there isn't anything obvious from there that we could do different. The only suggestion might be is that with last year's data, um, potentially so with shrubbery which was in wheat last year and this year which featured in both we see the high yielding sites not quite meeting our grain uh, our, our benchmark for grain n of 1.9 whereas the the lower yielding headland site is on both occasions so there's the the interesting point that is potentially could could those higher yielding sites um benefit from a, a slightly higher nitrogen rate um it would suggest that on the hot headland site that actually 200 is about optimum but potentially monitor that over a few more years to see should they be reduced on that. Is, is it consistently 1.9 or does it creep up higher than that? The other advantage of the grain nutrient content um, is that we obviously get other nutrients and we can then link that back to soil indices. Um, generally, as uh, Brian, so soil P was uh, good. We were above index two. There wasn't any concerns from that point of view. However, what's interesting this year, um, a, a vast majority of sites didn't meet the 0.32 um, grain P concentration, suggesting that uh, maybe there's another limiting factor. 
we've shown the grain end potentially nitrogen was the limiting factor which may have even been limiting um both from a uh, how much we apply but of the other interactions such as moisture or, or drought actually it was quite wet early on in the season <coughs> and after excuse me after the first nitrogen application potentially we lost quite a bit of that um through the profile out of the rooting zone uh, obviously that's all um, anecdotal we haven't got that measured but uh, potentially monitor that over a number of years to see you know are we consistently not meeting our our grain p threshold um, and are we are we sure that that's an issue we could could address? Um, potassium um, is uh, better in terms of the, the our soil K indices, as, as described, where where we'd hope they'd be, and our grain K uh, uh, indice of uh, our grain K uh, concentrations were above the threshold uh, determined optimal for a K. It's, we're a little less confident in in what grade K grain potassium uh, thresholds is as the, we are with uh, phosphorus but um, generally uh, promising signs there prime that potentially not not nothing needs to change too much in terms of a, a potassium management as mentioned earlier uh, magnesium is difficult to manage on these soils um, and we saw that the, there's a large amount of a, a large amount of sites we sampled were below uh, index two suggesting that potentially um, we might have deficiencies um, Brian does um, apply quite a lot of bitter salts to try and remediate this. He recognises this, but we can see um, that actually a number of sites, over half of the sites, also um, were low in 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 our grain uh, magnesium concentrations. So potentially, um, there's work that Brian can do to look at other me methods of getting magnesium into the crop, um, and it, it, it tends not to be a, a yield-related problem. In that, uh, generally, most sites are below that that grain MG threshold. But just demonstrating how it can be useful to look at both what's going on in the soil and then also in the crop to identify how we might be able to manage that on targets and zones. So just a, a brief summary of uh, this year's and last year's work. Um, the yield map data sets, um, oh, sorry, disappeared again. But anyway, the I yield maps um, can be useful for identifying areas that we can then specifically go and sample so we can reduce our need for um, spatial soil sampling or gridded soil sampling and we can also link what's going on in the soil to our yield data initially we the first year suggested that some of these low yielding areas um, potentially could be reduced in their nitrogen applications both on grain and and our soil post-harvest soil nitrogen. We didn't see this year. This year, obviously, season is a um, big factor, and actually, it's worth repeating this over a number of years. Uh, particularly if you pick, as we've done here, a manageable amount of sites, say 12, that are representative of the whole farm. Um, it, it's not too much to then go and do soil and, and grain nutrient analysis on those sites and infer what might be going on uh, across the farm at a wider level. Certainly on headlands or, or consistently low yielding areas that we can. Uh, link to, for example, as as uh, Susie mentioned, if you've got areas that are consistently lowering yielding for the same reason, such as waterlogging, as, as she explained, um, you could link the, the sort of grain nutrient contents for a couple of those sites and infer that potentially sites that we know that might be yield limiting for the same factor could be managed the same. So just briefly, what uh, something we're going to build on on the new strategic farm at Morley um, with David Jones is looking at how other methods in apart from um, soil and, and grain testing could be used to manage this such spatial variation we're going to focus on one field that's been monitored as part of a long-term project at Morley called Morley Sams <coughs> excuse me where we have large uh, yield variation as well as large variation in soil uh, texture and we also have um, from grain protein measuring on combines uh, we see a large difference in grain nutrient use efficiency uh, and we're going to use test uh, various methods of managing nitrogen whether it for a canopy end sensor that's either fit to the, the combine or or for remote sensing um, we can use retrospective grain n yield based approach as well which is uh, just adjusting nitrogen based on historic yield performance and then also approach that we've been developing at morley that's using crop models uh, to identify optimal end management and we can attest that on these this spatial variation by running identical end response experiments to determine exactly what the economic end optimum is, but also looking at soil, uh, post-harvest soil end to identify what 
the influence of that economic end is on the environment and potential losses, but then also see how uh, these technologies that we have at our disposal um, compare to what our economic end optima is. So to provide confidence that these technologies can get to a economic end optimum um, level uh, spatially. And I, yeah, that's me, me done. Brilliant. Thank you so much, David. Thank you very much. I always find it quite interesting how you're sort of using those yield maps to sort of identify infill variation and then how you can just use them to then adjust where you're going to be soil sampling and, and what management practices you take after that. Then also areas that are sort of consistently underperforming. I think, you know, with the flexibility and the value of the sort of new SFI schemes, it's probably quite interesting for farmers to sort of look at those yield maps, like Susie said, year on year, you know, consistently underperforming areas and what else can you be doing um, to sort of seek profit rather than trying to correct in build as there ways that you can just take it out of the rotation. Um, especially if it's sort of squaring up a field or taking out a sort of un unmanageable corner. So I've got a bit of time now for Q and A. Um, we have got a few questions come in, but make sure you just keep putting them into the questions box and we'll try to get them answered. So if all the speakers could just rejoin me um, on the screen and I'll um, ask the first question, which is for, well, I think it's for Steve and David. If Dave Dagman's joined us again, our student farm in Scotland. Um, I think Steve's still here. Yeah, brilliant. So. Is BRICS monitoring affordable and easy for farmers to understand? Um, and is there any guidance out there to help farmers understand that? I think probably adding to that, if you, if you, you can't do BRICS monitoring, what is the sort of entry level it, sort of crop nutrition that you could do, um, measurements that you could do throughout the season? Is it sort of tissue testing or do you think you should be doing sap testing? That's, Steve, that's for Steve or, or David. Yeah, I guess um, what we're trying to do is to use the same device for, for the BRICS units and test it over uh, different times in the season and across treatments just to see whether the measurements relate to change in, in the crop um, during the season and, and between treatments. So the way we do it is probably not so farm friendly because it's it's a more um laborious kind of testing but i know david and others are using different devices which i believe are are more speedy sort of quicker to get readings from and again we need to relate these perhaps to um to, to a standard protocol so that we could transfer this across um across farms Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Dave, you got anything to that to sort of people who are wanting to start measuring crop nutrition throughout the season? You know, is there is there something that you started doing before you were Student Farm Scotland that you found sort of quite easy to get a hold of and, and eat sort of not too expensive or Yeah, the the the, the bricks meter or a refractometer you can buy off um any well known internet trading site for well, 20 to 30 quid they're not expensive at all um and it i find it gives an indication as to the as to the general well-being of the plant i suppose if we get a good high bricks number then we know there's plenty of sugars in the plant which indicates the plant's functioning um as it should uh mm -hmm. the tricky bit comes when you get a low bricks number um and trying to identify what's causing the problem um which which bit of nutrition is missing or even in excess. Um, and there are some handheld meters you can buy. They're not that cheap, but I suppose, spread over a few years, they can be quite cheap to just help test other trace elements, or even just back it up with a, a tissue test or a sap test, if you wish to, to help. But as a quick look, see, I mean, if you, if you, personally, if I, if I was to test the crop and it comes out of the bricks of 15 or 18 or 20, I wouldn't bother taking a, uh, a tissue sample because the crop's happy it's functioning away fine there's no need to do it so one can save a bit of time and effort in that respect so how did you learn about this then david where did you sort of understand get this understanding um, it started when i went to a meeting 
oh, seven maybe years ago, I forget, uh, an Australian chap by the name of Graham State was, had been doing it. And uh, he's into this nutrition farming and trying to do things without chemicals, as it were. And he came to farm locally um, and showed us a few things. And it kind of, it just seems so simple to do and something, yeah, you can carry the equipment around in your pocket and it's cheap. And of course, that caught my attention and we just started from then. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, just further to that, I've got a question here from James saying, um, you commented on the confidence of bricks, but how how much confidence do you have in the SPAD metadata? I think David uh, Clark and Steve, you've both been talk, spoke about SPAD in your presentation, so perhaps you can both uh, find an answer to that. Yeah, go ahead, David. Please. No, yeah, I was briefly going to say we are confident. You know, we we've always interpreted SPAD as a as a measure of sort of chlorophyll content within the leaf. Um, and we found I didn't include the data there. I'll see when we we measured it at the exact same time we sent our leaf tissue analysis off, um, and we found very strong correlation between our leaf tissue and our end concentrations and our SPAD readings. Um, the issue I have with both of those is neither of those then uh, at any timing was then correlated to final yield or even grain nutrient or nitrogen content. So um, although useful in determining potentially, you know, specifically uh, N, we didn't actually were able to determine anything that we could do differently that would might have impacted that from that. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Steve, got anything to add? Yeah, it's, it, I guess it's really what, what the objective is, and we're, we're trying to use um, this kind of measure in, in, in different ways. And um, we are looking at it in terms of um, of yield, but also sort of general health of the crop. And we're not so concerned as, as getting the highest SPAD possible. Uh, you know that's that's not the, really the objective, and that that might not be the best for the crop. It's getting you the, the level that can inform on perhaps how much nitrogen the crop is taking up, and how that nitrogen then can subsequently be be used. So so it's combining it with other measures. I, th I think is important. And um, for, 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 for your prediction, we're we're not going to rely on just one measure alone. It's it's, it's it'll be uh, bringing together several measures including the the health of the leaf canopy which has a big impact on what we call green leaf area so um yeah so i think it's bringing these elements together and um yeah i, I think that's the way forward with, with some of these kind of standard measures brilliant thank you very much steve uh and a question for dave dave blacker and susie potentially um if you're adding drainage to a more waterlogged field um with a low yield and a high organic matter, would you expect the organic matter to then degree, de decrease, and then would that then impact yield either sort of negatively or positively? Sort of switching up and adding the drainage, what would you expect to happen to that, those sort of high organic matter levels if your field is quite waterlogged? Yeah, if you can get rid of the if you get rid of the water to start with, then your field is going to become more biologically active. So you would expect that organic matter that's just sitting there to then to break down quite quickly, uh, which potentially would lead to quite a lot of nutrient cycling and higher yield on the back of it, given it's got a nicer environment to be growing in. So yeah, I would I would think all of them would happen. I think that's right, and it'll be interesting to see what happens in over the next few years in the drainage trial we do have yeah i'm confident that the yield will improve with the drainage but whether organic matter also falls measurably yeah definitely um and then i've got two more questions quickly um could yield maps help make decisions on where best to put break crops and sfi options i think dave, dave have you been doing that with your sort of rotation recently, Dave Blacker and Dave Clark, you probably want to add to that. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, if you want to see where your fields aren't performing, the yield maps you go to place, and you can see your know, regularity in that. Then, yeah, you know, if they're going to be financially better off in SFI, put them in SFI. We're running businesses after all, not charities here. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, um, <laughs> you know, whatever makes you the most funny. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Dave. Dave Clark, you got anything to add to that? I suppose that's what they've been doing at Student Farm is, like you said, taking those sort of areas out and putting them into stewardship. Yeah, so I think from that, from from that, that's not easy, but that's certainly the easiest of that, that question. That's the easiest bit to do because you can look at, you know, consistent performing, performing areas and make an informed decision whether it makes economic sense to put that into something else, whether that be SFI or, uh, or whatever. Um, the rotational bit is we, we did try and look at that and we have looked at it more. It's more difficult because seas, certainly as you get to crops that aren't so, ro you know, rotationally important. So, for example, um, Brian, you know, one in five years, you, you'll have five wheat crops across the rotation, whereas you may only have one fall seed rape, one spring bean, one. Um, so, so those break crops, you don't have that temporal data sets that you do have with wheat so it's harder to say well what's a you know what's a year what's what's consistently um a poor performing area in beans or or right because you may only have one or two years over a 10-year map yield map data set so that's much much harder to um to 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 infer but that being said that's where actually sort of sort of brands on farm or an on farm perspective can come into it when you look at something that might be poor performing in wheat consistently and then it does really poor in rape whether it's you know by a woodland that, that gets attacked by pigeons or whatever that might be i suppose you can make those decisions but it is certainly harder to to look at across the rotation and it's one thing i will add it's also really and that's why we kept the analysis to field level because it's very hard to compare to fields because actually um, we found sort of certainly if you look at drilling date, we know that has a big impact on on yield. And actually, you may try and drill your more challenging, lower yielding areas first, certainly uh, to to know that you've got less window to get them on. So therefore, actually, when you try and compare that to a field that's drilled a month later, you can't compare one part of that field to another uh, for those different reasons. So so they are limited in the sense that you know you it's best just to look at them at a single field level. And then obviously you get the inaccuracies with yield map data that we've, we've shown with Brian's that then make it harder without some sort of ground truthing to compare across seasons. Yeah, so you're sort of saying using the yield maps, but then also going out and doing some physical measuring as well, just to confirm what your sort of suspicions are. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Dave. Um, and then David Aglan, I think this is a question for you. Um, do you have any advice for someone who is wanting to start out grazing cash crops? I think they said about the uh, cheap size and where to graze them and when to take them off. Oh, I think you're on mute, Dave. Oh, sorry, that's better. Um, yeah, don't don't get too brave too soon with my my start. Uh, if you haven't got a sheep of your own, find a helpful grazier who wants to, who, who's engaged in what you want to do with your farm and help your soil health and, and your uh, and your fertility. Uh, we're lucky here; we've got good graziers now that um, that we can manage, and they understand what we need out of the out of the, the grazing of the cereals. Um, depends where in the part in the country you are. Um, the question was comment was made earlier about. How, future the future of grazing and how much we'll do here i think to steve and we had a lucky last year was a very early season we could get a lot of winter cereals thrown early and they were very strong and lush so we grazed everything whereas this year we're back to a more typical scottish autumn and the crops are nowhere near as strong so we'll be grazing a lot less this year um purely down to the the the, the size of the crops so i think the flexibility is key we thought we had it sussed last year, but we we're back to square one again and we'll grease some fields and not others, but flexibility and find the right people to help you, I think is the would be my um advice. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. I think that's probably quite true. No one expected uh, the autumn to be like it was this year and we all sort of had such a lovely time last autumn, didn't we? So uh, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of my the speakers and the audience for joining us. Um, so if you just click the next slide, Maya, we'll just close it up. So the next uh, webinar taking place is on next Wednesday on the 14th of November. 
um, and it's putting IPM to work on your farm, where we'll be sort of exploring some themes around risk management, grass control, um, and flowering strips. Um, and I suppose that will link a bit to Strategic Farm East, where we've been looking at some flowering strip trials. Um, and also what we've been speaking about today, where you could be removing sort of poor performing areas, maybe looking into sort of these flowering strips through the SFI. I think I looked today, um, and I think under SFI, SFI, SFI IPM2, infield flowering strips or margins, you get £673 a hectare. And if you put the insecticide, uh, no insecticide on top, it's an extra additional £45 a hectare. Um, and you're sort of getting those additional benefits potentially from um, uh, predators um, on your sort of crop pests. But I think David Jones next week will sort of go into a bit more detail about, you know, you get this extra money for IPM through SFI, but how can then you make IPM work even better through spending that money on different sort of management practices? So it's not all just about sort of getting the money and pocketing it. Um, I think he's going to be looking into more what else can you do to potentially have the benefits um, of these sort of beneficials. So thank you very much. Um, like I said, this webinar is going to be recorded, so it'll be on the AHTV YouTube channel and all of the results from this year's trials and previous year trials from across the farm network uh, will also be available on the AHDB website um, to look at sort of at your own expense. So thank you all very much for coming um, and next week, uh, I hope to see you then. Hope I'm not hosting next week, so you won't see me, but you'll see a few of these lovely, lovely faces on here today. So thank you very much, and uh, yeah, see you soon.